Hey guys, my name is Josh McCart and I'm an environmental scientist with Pasco County Schools. I work here at the beautiful Energy Marine Center and today we're going to talk a little bit about mangroves. So we have three mangroves that grow here in Pasco County. Now mangroves are a special species. They grow in salt water. Uh, we have brackish water here, but they do uh, grow offshore in a more salty of water. Uh, the three mangroves, there's a couple ways to identify them. One is by their leaves. Uh, we have all three examples here. This is a red mangrove. This one is a black mangrove. And then we have a white mangrove. And so what we look for is the shape, size, and color. Uh, the red mangrove has the darkest green. It's kind of the broadest leaf, has kind of a defined tip. The white mangrove is kind of this yellowish green, has more of an oval shape and uh, kind of a rounded tip. The black mangrove, kind of two tones, got an olive colored side. It's the longer skinnier of the three mangroves um, and has not as well defined tip on it. So another way to identify mangroves other than using their leaves are to look at their root structures. And so red mangroves kind of are the easiest to identify. They have these long prop roots. And we're gonna show you an example here. Uh, right here, coming out of the base of the tree, we have this prop root comes down into the ground. Now this is going to do two things for that plant. It's going to provide it some support. Um, we get lots of currents, tides, waves that come into the estuary here. And so this kind of stabilizes it in a pretty soft soil uh, and so it keeps it upright. All right, so behind me here, this tall tree, this is a black mangrove. Um, if we follow it down, this is its root trunk right down here. Um, we're going to find these things called nematophores. And so nematophores are kind of like this little snorkel or skeleton finger sticking up out of the ground. And that allows for that plant to breathe. Right over here we have a white mangrove. And if we follow that white mangrove down, you're going to see that this white mangrove doesn't have any prop roots, doesn't have any uh, nematophores poking up out of the ground and they don't have any specialized vertical roots that allow them to breathe in uh, high tides or uh, inundation of water for long periods of time. So they need to be the furthest up shore. And so we get this zonation where mangroves occur. And so the red mangroves are gonna be the deepest out closest to the shoreline uh, because of those prop roots that allows them to breathe during the highest tides. Uh, the black mangroves, their tiny little skeleton fingers, those nematophores sticking out of the ground, they allow them to uh, breathe, but not as deep of water as the red mangroves. So they're going to be a little bit further up shore. And then finally, the furthest up shore is going to be your white mangroves because they lack those vertical roots that are associated with the other two mangroves. So a lot of students ask why uh, mangroves are called red, black, and white. And so um, the leading belief or the reason for their names is that if you look at the red mangrove, these prop roots, if I were to just take some water and wet it, um, it gives it more of a red appearance. And as they soak uh, for long periods of time during that high tide, they get that reddish color to them. Uh, the black mangroves, the Native Americans used to use the roots of the black mangrove to um, dye leathers black. And so the tannins that are in that root structure were used to dye. So I really don't know why the white mangrove is called the white mangrove. Um, I kind of guess that it might be due to the flower it produces. Come June, July, it's gonna have a flower that's gonna attract pollinators. Now on the stem, just before the leaf, you're gonna see two little pores. And those pores or glands are called nectarines. And nectarines produce nectar. And so that attracts the pollinators. They come, they um, pollinate the, the uh, propagules, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then uh, they move on from one plant to the next. Why do mangroves thrive in salt water where if I were to take salt water and pour it on plants at your house, they most likely would die, right? Um, they're able to exclude and excrete salt. And so the red mangroves, they use these aerial roots and prop roots to help filter out. They have those little pores called lenticels and that allows for them to exclude the salt and only take in fresh water. Um, the black mangrove, uh, one of our students' favorites out here, are able to actually excrete salt. So they do uh, exclude, but some of that salt still comes into their system 
through their xylems and then it is channeled to the leaf and on the leaf you will get crystallization of some of the salts that it's excreting out through those pores and so the students like to lick these leaves because you can really taste the salt on the leaf and uh, i'll demonstrate here and yes it is very salty if you lick a uh, red or white mangrove leaf you just look silly they don't excrete salt Another really cool thing about mangroves is they are viviparous. So that's a big science word. What does that mean? That means that they actually give live birth. Humans, we're viviparous. We give live birth. Uh, so like most plants, produce seeds and then they drop off. They get blown away by wind or carried off by the water. And then they germinate in soil. These actually germinate right on the parent plant. But they start off as a little propagule on the plant like this. And so this is kind of like its umbilical cord, getting all of its nutrients from its parent. And then come September, October, these guys are big, long green beans, and they drop off. I've got some examples over here I'm going to show you. And so it's a little late in the season uh, to be finding uh, any viable propagules still floating around, but there's a couple I found today. Um, and so when they float in the water, a lot of times they'll float horizontally for a couple weeks until they become waterlogged and they write themselves in the water and float vertically. And so what they're gonna do is they're gonna wash up on shore and then they'll get caught in between some rocks and or an old fiddler crab hole. Each species of mangroves has a different shaped propagule. The red mangrove has that long green bean looking one. Uh, the black mangroves are gonna have more of a lima bean kind of shaped one, about the size of a quarter. And then the white mangroves, they have more what looks like a sunflower seed um, that would float in the water for up to a year. Now there's lots of animals that live on mangroves. And so right over here, we have a mangrove tree crab I wanna show you. And he's clinging onto that branch. And the mangrove tree crabs will actually scrape the leaves and eat some of the uh, leaf matter um, to get their food. Mangroves provide what we call ecological services. These are things that they do that help the environment or the animals that live in that environment. And so one of the really cool things that they do is they help anchor our shoreline. And so today we got kind of a stormy day out here. Uh, the chop on the bay is a little bit bigger than we would expect in this semi-enclosed habitat. Uh, we're in an estuary, so we have a mixture of fresh and salt water. Um, it's partially enclosed, semi-enclosed, um, which gives it some protection but mangroves slow water down and so these guys about five feet of them will knock a three foot wave down to nothing um, whereas if you're going through marsh grasses it might take 50 feet for that wave of water to slow down so they're also a buffer they're going to buffer the coastline which is important for humans because they protect our homes and prevent tidal surge and flooding and things like that um, so these roots we call these mangrove tangles and so you can see if you were to try to walk through this tangle of roots here, um, that water coming through is slowing down. And as it slows down, any suspended solids, these are going to be like silts, clays, sands, any floating particle in that water, it's going to have a chance to settle out. And so they're really good at storing carbon. Um, it's been documented about five times better than any terrestrial plant species that we might have. And so they're what we call a blue carbon sink. And so they're going to be really good um, with taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They get this large biomass that gets caught and tangled up in their roots and then it gets stored there in the muck. So I want to show you guys what's happening to our mangroves um, and what's especially happened to them over the last 30 years. And so this is a picture of the EMC. And if you look at it, there's mostly brown marsh grass, brown marsh grass, 
mostly shoreline, a few speckles of mangroves, a couple mangroves here and here, but really nothing along here, a couple over this way. And today, if you look at our estuary, So back in 2017, it might have been 2018, January, um, we had a cold freeze that came through and it was a pretty hard freeze and it um, snapped some of our mangroves. So mangroves are not cold tolerant. They don't like cold water or cold weather. They um, actually froze the tips off some of the white mangroves and the red and black mangroves did pretty good. But if I can change this, I don't think I can. We'll do this. Uh, we've got mangroves all along our shoreline here, all over our uh, oyster beds that used to be barren. And so they have just exploded with mangroves. And so what we're seeing is this encroachment of mangroves. They're moving north. And if I show you on the map here, here's a map of Florida. Uh, just above uh, Tampa Bay here, is Port Ritchie where we're at. And this is about the northern boundary of where mangroves historically would grow. Uh, south of here, down into the Florida Bay, uh, in the Everglades, this is gonna be the predominant area in that subtropical area where we get more into a temperate area up by us. Um, so we do experience some freezes, but over the last 30 years, we've not had really hard freezes and that kind of excludes mangroves from moving north. And now mangroves are being found all the way up into the Panhandle. Louisiana, Mississippi, over into Texas, back down. Uh, and so mangroves are expanding their habitat. They're changing where they can grow uh, based on those hard freezes. And so that's kind of influencing where some of the species goes. Snook are a species that goes with mangroves. And so as mangroves encroach north, so do the snook populations. All right, so I finally figured out to flip my camera long ways not vertical uh, and makes for better videos but um, I did want to just wrap up real quick let you guys know a couple things that I failed to mention um, mangroves are a protected species here in the United States um, there are state city uh, county ordinances for trimming mangroves sometimes it's just best to hire somebody that knows what they're doing uh, so if you do live along the water um, you are allowed to trim them, um, but there's only so much you can trim. A minimum of six foot is, uh, you know, the lowest you can go. And, you know, we can't cut if they're extending out in the water past their prop roots. Um, so there's, there's lots of things and uh, it's best if you just hire somebody that knows what they're doing. There are mangrove associates. Now these aren't true mangroves here in the state of Florida. We have what's called the buttonwood. Um, it's not viviparous and that's kind of what makes mangroves mangroves is that uh, live birth. And so um, another thing I forgot to mention, white mangroves, really cool that uh, they have this ability to be able to live in water with the highest salinity. And so the highest salt tolerance, and you would think why would the mangrove the furthest away from the water uh, be able to do that? And so the belief is that they live in these salt pans, these areas that get inundated with high king tides and then the water evaporates, leaves behind this salt. And so they've evolved in these habitats where there's high salt content in the soils and they just have to uh, be better adapted. And I think they can live up to 105 parts per thousand, just to give you a perspective. Uh, in our estuary, we have about 18 parts per thousand, that's the salinity. And then the Gulf of Mexico is only about 32 parts per thousand. Um, globally, mangroves are distributed basically between 28 degrees north and 28 degrees south. These are gonna be your tropical, subtropical habitats. And uh, I think I kind of uh, spoofed at the end there. I mentioned that they were excluded from going north because of those hard freezes. Um, and now that we're not having the hard freezes, they're kind of free to go uh, further north. And so that, that propugal uh, that is given off by the parent plant it has all that nutrients, can float up to a year, the currents, tides take them out and they can travel thousands of miles. And so you have this global distribution so if you've got any additional questions, um, things I might be able to answer about mangroves for you or your students, um, please reach out and uh, I'll link some different things in the bottom here of resources that we have um, for our students. And uh, thanks for watching.